The road to delivering digital content at Siemens Mobile. I thought I'd got away with not having video, but at the last moment he walked in with a camera and uh, now I have other Siemens people in the audience, so the pressure is fully on. Let's see how we uh, can deliver. My objective today is to give you a little bit of insight into some of the business drivers that Siemens experienced uh, that drove them to implement a new technology stack, um, which happened to use DITA, um, to improve some of their processes. It only touches on part of the big picture, because you can imagine uh, there are lots of other aspects, but I'm concentrating more on the documentation side of that. I guess you all know who Siemens are. I guess that we should just establish, just in case there's anyone in the audience who's never heard of Siemens. Anybody willing to put their hand up? Uh, I mean, they're a huge, huge company, uh, touching so many parts of our lives, in fact. Uh, yesterday, we were cleaning up our stand at the conference center downstairs, and we were using a Siemens vacuum cleaner. And I'm sure some of you may have even come on the train in a Siemens train, um, in which case you've all had some connection. The division that I'm talking about is based in the UK. It's effectively Siemens PLC, uh, which is part of Siemens Mobility. And Siemens Mobility uh, doesn't just do trains. Um, they're actually involved in many aspects of mobile uh, equipment and, and devices. Um, and I don't mean mobile like the thing you put in your pocket. Um, but the area that we're looking at is trains specifically, uh, and the division, as I say, is in the UK. So a quick introduction of the companies that perhaps are involved in this. John Straw is the publications manager at Siemens Mobility or Siemens Rail. Uh, it's actually the PLC division in the UK. He should be stood next to me delivering this presentation, and sadly he wasn't able to. And it's probably because of the success of this project that uh, he's been promoted and he started his new job, I think, this week within Siemens um, and, and asked me if I would carry the, carry the torch. So thank you to John for helping me with prepar preparing the information you're going to see. Um, a little bit about me. So my name is Julian Murphy. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Mekon. Uh, we have been in the business for 20, well, it's actually our 27th year. I've mistyped that because we've been in it for over 25 years. And we're in, really in the technical documentation business, delivering consultancy, training, expertise around everything from S1000D to DITA to uh, XML generally. And I don't want to oversell that because that's not what you're here to talk about and listen to. But we do have a stand and do come and see us. we quite near the oxygen stand if you're walking around in Hall 2. Uh, and you're welcome to come and chat to us about what we've been doing with this client and also many others uh, ar around the world. CAD IT are not here, but I just wanted to really mention them because a lot of the slides I've been able to use have come from them, so I thank them for uh, some, some of the information. The CAD IT are a specialist Siemens implementation partner, uh, and so they're the experts in Team Center and a product called Rapid Author uh, from Katona 3D. And this forms quite an important part of the project. I'm not here to sell any of these products, I really am not, uh, but it, it's important to understand the context of of what made it possible to, to do the solution. So they're a, a actually Singapore owned, but based in Ireland and the UK. And then uh, lastly, uh, DittaWeb, which is actually the company of uh, Congility, and they're actually sharing a bit of the stand with us at the conference here. And DittaWeb is a dynamic delivery platform that uh, makes the most of Ditta um, if you're in that space. Okay. So let's get into some of the meat of this. You are going to see that, and perhaps some of you are going to say, well, that's no, nothing new. Uh, the concept that uh, downtime might cause challenges at the point of consumption is not really common, uh, an uncommon statement. 
And if you're in the technical communications world, we're constantly battling with senior management to make them realize this. And sadly, they don't always see it. Dave Hooper, program director, he's up there. And he's recognized that they're having challenges. Uh, it's been a long-standing issue. And so, really, their question is, well, what do we do about it? Um, in, um, earlier in this year, and in fact, spring of 2016, they just deployed the first trains in the UK for a project that uh, runs somewhere between Cambridge and the south. I can't mention the name because I haven't had approval, uh, amazingly, but it crosses the Thames, and that's as much as I can say. You can work it out if you're British. Uh, it links them. Um, and this project was run under Siemens PLC, as I mentioned. And it's what they've called a total service logistics project. And their objective was to design and build a whole series of trains. And they do this, of course, in Germany is their main office or main um, center. And the process of designing and building them it uses, obviously, some very complex processes. But the documentation is usually a bit of an afterthought. But there's an extra piece to this because not only are they building and delivering the equipment, which, of course, most manufacturers do, they're also going to be maintaining them. And maintaining them is where the total service logistics piece comes in. We've seen this now in some aircraft manufacturing environments. Um, we see it in cars, in fact. You probably bought a car recently, and they offer you these much better deals to say, buy this car and we'll give you five years of servicing. And that five years of servicing means that they've taken a responsibility to make sure that it works well, because if it doesn't, they're the ones that are carrying the cost. This is quite a new concept, but it's a great one for the consumer, because it means the manufacturer is the one that carries the can. And so in this case, the pounds or the euros are going to start flowing in the wrong direction for the, for the supplier's point of view if they don't get it right. So the business challenge for Siemens in this case is keeping the trains running at an optimal level, making sure they're always running and they have uh, quite high objectives in this regard. And therefore improving the effectiveness of the team is also important. If the engineers are not doing their job as well as they could, then it's actually directly costing them the money. And then capitalizing on the knowledge within the business. Tech pubs is a center of all fountain of all knowledge, and yet actually our engineers and our technicians have got a lot of information. And how do we capture that information and then bring it back into the process? And the size of this project um, is 115 trains you see there. Now, 115 trains, if you, anybody had a Hornby set? Uh, if you had a Hornby train set, you might think, well, trains, they're pretty simple, aren't they? A little bit with wet, little bogies, and it's simple. You just plug them together. Actually, trains are not quite as simple as I thought. And um, they have set car lengths. So we have six cars, and or actually they don't call them cars, they call them vehicles. Uh, six vehicles and 12 vehicles on this particular line. And in some other areas, they might have five or eight. Now, that might seem just simple. You just disconnect and reconnect. And no, no, no. It's a much more complex process. So their configuration of the whole train is actually part of the whole project. Um, and in fact, the maintenance of these um, is done in two custom-built uh, workshops that are in the one's quite near Gatwick Airport, and the other is north of London. And these two centres, which are s absolutely stunning, actually, if you ever want to see a clean environment to work in, it's wonderful. And they have these trains coming in about every 42 days for a 20,000-mile service. So you imagine if you had to do that with your car. So every 20,000 miles, train comes in and then gets serviced. They have some really cool, funky kit that we're not talking about specifically today, which is worth mentioning just for interest, that they have scanners that scan the, the train as it comes in to the depot uh, fo photographically, and they use then maths and uh, comparison data to see whether anything is not quite right. Is anything missing on the train? Uh, if it's been through a dodgy area, maybe it's something's been stolen. But actually, more seriously, if the wheels are wearing, they can actually tell 
from this analysis so they can tell that it may be millimetres of difference and that they actually need to do some repairs or maintenance. So we've got some pretty good stuff that's going into the process. But when they looked at this, some of the management was saying, OK, what can we do to improve it? This scanning system might be one way to improve their functionality, but they recognised that documentation was actually quite an issue. And the traditional method for this team, as quoted by David Hooper, is that they would outsource it. And they'd outsource it to a team who would then write up the documentation and then send it backwards and forwards for review. And I'm not saying that many people do that. Many people do, do use outsource people. You may even be doing it internally. But their particular issue was that, that meant there was a real disconnect between the data that they had in the business, the knowledge they had in the business, uh, and critically, the whole process of when they could get access to the information. So this is one, another business challenge. And then finally on this one, Ben Ward, the production. He, his real challenge, I think, is to highlight the non-conformance issue here. Non-conformance in their perspective is, if I'm working on the vehicle and the manual doesn't quite say what I'm seeing, I have a non-conformance. And the non-conformance then takes time to get repaired, and from a documentation point of view, it takes review, it takes all sorts of feedback and valuable engineers' time. And this is costing them. So, again, another issue. So managing the technical queries and the TQs, as they call them, or capturing non-conformance uh, uh, is, is actually quite an issue. So this total service logistics, look at some of the key keys to Pat's success that they felt that they might be able to look at. If they could do maintenance, and manual, ma maintenance manuals, um, actually looking at the whole process for what you might call PLM, product lifecycle management, the engineering data that's coming through, then maybe the document creation and management could be more integrated. The service lifecycle management, this is the notion that when you build something, it doesn't stop, right? The whole life cycle is that I design something, I build it, I maintain it, I re-engineer it, I may modify it and update it. So there's a whole life cycle of information, which engineering and the product life cycle management industry, of which Siemens are leaders in, in the team center space, if you've ever heard of it, this is a whole process that ha actually, to date doesn't seem to be touching the tech docs world a great deal. We also want to le leverage this core engineering data, things like the 3D data. If you're going to go to the trouble of designing your equipment using 3D, why can't we use it in more, uh, more exciting ways for the technical documentation? And then deploying the information, we need to make sure we deploy it in a way that is actually more visually exciting or visually uh, engaging, reduce the amount of text, um, make it easier for the engineers and the technicians to be able to engage with the information. Make sure it's at the right place at the right time. And also then be able to capture feedback from those people so that the errors that you're inevitably going to have somewhere in the process can be captured and then fed back. So a little bit of touch of why DITA or is DITA any element to this? Well, from John's point of view, um, he was keen on the flexibility in its architecture. It's true to say that Siemens don't use DIDA across the business. In fact, it might be only one or two units in the country at the moment or in the business that are using DIDA. That's not to say that it won't grow. And this isn't a pitch necessarily for DIDA. It's just to say, well, what was their specific business challenge? And for them, they had a desire to do some specialisation that suited their content, and they wanted to do that in a way with a tool set or a technology that seemed to understand that and support it. So they felt that the flexibility in the architecture that would be helpful to use dinner. They were also keen on the standards aspect of this, uh, in that they've got a longevity of 30 years on this one project alone. So they've got to maintain these trains for 30 years. Unlike other scenarios where you sell a product and say, enjoy, they actually have a responsibility. They can't just deliver substandard information or have a problem down the line and say, well, yeah, that's an old one. We, we, we don't support that anymore. 
which is so often the case now. Uh, these guys actually do want to look after it for a long period. The other thing is flexibility in technology. Um, they had a, let's say, um, um, influence from up high to use Team Center. And not adversely, because actually it made absolute sense for them to do so. But in doing so, that meant that, that was one decision perhaps they didn't need to go further with. But all the other technology that underpins or interacts and relates to Team Center, they could use anything they like. They didn't go to one company where they might be perhaps shoehorned into one trail, which you might get with some technologies. So they're not tied to one supplier was a good thing. And then the last one actually was specifically for them, they wanted to be able to make the decision about deployment of the content later than when they actually started writing the content. Now, it's got its dangers and it's something you have to be a bit careful about, but they had the foresight to engage well, fortunately us, but they engaged consultants to look at their architecture properly so that the architecture would support that later delivery. But nonetheless, the actual technology that they pushed the key to say, we'll have that one, they didn't have to do at the beginning. And this gave them flexibility. And they had the confidence to do that because they were looking at an open standard that was already starting to uh, generate interest with a number of companies, not just DidaWeb, but some of the other tools that are out there that, in fact, Mekon deploy in other places. So let's have a little look at uh, perhaps how this might have looked in a, in a normal situation and then dovetail that with the way they actually work. So integrated service lifecycle management is a mouthful, but essentially we're saying this whole life cycle of information coming from the start to the end of design. And traditionally, you might have a situation where information is designed. They have a design team. They're working on the R&D. And they go through this process with the first red bar you see there. And then later on, once they've got a piece of equipment that they can look at, the authors then get a hold of it. And then they can start writing. And this is pretty normal, right? Um, Maybe not always. And in the software business, it has a different challenge. But with hardware equipment, this would happen. And the authors then have to do their discovery. And the people that are going to maintain the equipment don't get much of a chance to interact with this at this stage because they haven't, they're not even seeing this. And so later on, they'll then start to see what the <coughs> documentation looks like. And then it will get published. Whereas with the team center process that they adopted, they were able to bring this much further to be the beginning of the design process. And the idea here is that they integrated it with a product called Cotona 3D Rapid Author, which is a way which I'll touch on in a second on how that actually allows them to access the information. But moreover, then the whole process is connected with this life cycle. This PLM-based technology has a whole process of managing engineering change requirements to modify something or the supply of a piece of equipment, how long, long something might last. All of that useful information is held in the PLM, but doesn't always find its way out to tech docs. And by introducing this system and using the team center as their CMS, they were able to enhance or let's say capitalize on that within the process. So it becomes a complete link. And then once they came to the deployment, because they were able to use feedback capability within their deployment platform of choice, that comes back into the information that is being generated. So the authors and then ultimately the engineers are then capturing more feedback. So overall, their idea is that it improves the collaboration and the teamwork right from the beginning in the design process. They can integrate it with the engineering release process. And then, critically, it reduces time to market, which we'll touch on. So here's a um, slightly techie slide, but it, it just to show you some of the pieces and the components that they're, they're dealing with. So the manuals that they're working on, and in this case, this is a, a maintenance manual, they start with SAP. So actually, SAP is their main... PLM manufacturing environment. And they have part numbers like this A2V, and that part number has other associated information. 
things like the CAD drawings, maybe PDF, specifications, spreadsheets, anything that's related to that. And this lives in SAP, and that's their current project, as I understand. It then gets exploded, or the word they use is... Uh, what is that word? They have a special word. Shattered. They have a pr shattering process that takes that information, specifically the CAD 3D models, and extracts it and ties it up with data that tells it where that piece of information lives. So in fact, what they're able to do is understand how the whole train is constructed and where each component lives within a spatial environment. Okay, does that make sense? And so they're able to add this data to the 3D model when they bring it into Team Center. Once it's in Team Center, they're then working on the service bill of materials as opposed to the manufacturing bill of materials. Have you all heard of a bomb? People throw the word bomb around like it's confetti. Uh, but very clearly, every piece of equipment that gets made somewhere, there is a bill of materials. And they change. They're not always the same. In fact, the manufacturing may be buying in pieces of equipment, and that is a single component that goes into production. But actually, then, when you go into servicing it, you have to break that bomb down into smaller lumps because there are other components inside it. So it's quite a complex set of metadata that we need to keep hold of. So we're getting into some of the detail now of exactly what did they do and how, how did this help them. And John said, Team Center with Rapid Order takes solution to a whole new level. And I touch on a few other points that he's raised around that. It had a fundamental change to the way they worked. And this is not a specific XML issue. This is just the fact that they integrated their core Team Center database with all its assets and valuable information and then made use of that through the authoring process. So let's just have a little look at the architecture of what this technology looked like and then we can go a bit more into the way this all worked. So Team Center Technical Publishing, which is effectively a CCMS if you like, extracts the bomb as I mentioned from SAP. So it's now got a whole bunch of data, a whole series of CAD files, and these CAD files have got all sorts of detail, a 3D, it's all 3D model. And that core data can then be put into a project that they would use in their authoring environment. And that project can then do some automated cool things. Now, I'm not here to show it, but you can explore this a bit more. But what it does is it allows you to automatically burst the model and actually start creating steps within your XML automatically. And then the author's job is to re-engineer that, maybe reflow some of the processes. But actually it's putting down on, if you like, on paper in the early stages a lot of the key data that they're going to need. All of the parts information is automatically there. They can extract that straight from the system. They don't need to go and discover it. So this is where John's point about how great the savings were with this system because their discovery from the author's point of view was reduced hugely. He said that normally we have to go out into the shop floor, we have to go and have a look at the equipment, we have to even unbolt bits to be able to see how it works. We didn't have to do any of that because we could do it all virtually. We could look at the model and we could literally pull things apart and see how they work and then work out how the process would be to create the steps. And these steps in, the, in a, a, let's say, a repair or a clean or any process you might do as an engineer, first take this off, then put this in here, hold this up with a jack, whatever you have to do, all of those could be done virtually. And this, he said, saved a phenomenal amount. Once we've done that, and therefore we've taken advantage of this 3D data and all the other metadata that's in the system, they're able to then publish this and then put it back into Team Center as a management environment and then benefit from the life cycle and the updates that you get from the engineering change. So if something changes, if there's a requirement to do so, then there's a workflow that's already embedded in their engineering investment, but it actually then triggers the, tra uh, the authoring environment as well. Ultimately, it then gets published when it's approved or been signed off to a certain level and then it goes out through into their publishing platform, which in this case was Ditterweb, uh, which is their dynamic delivery platform 
to actually give it to the customer. And the customer in their case is a driver or an engineer or a technician, principally. So the core pieces were Cortona 3D Rapid Author, using XMetal, in fact, as the uh, authoring XML editor under the hood, fully integrated with the 3D modeling. Their team center workflows and the DITA um, supporting CCMS. And then DITA Web. So what are the documents we're talking about? Well, operator manuals I mentioned just a moment ago. This is the driver's manual. And I'll show you a couple of slides of what that looks like. And this is the same data. It may be slightly different levels of granularity and detail, but there's a reuse piece coming in here because I can reuse some of this content in both engineering environments and in the user and the driver's point of view. And then all the maintenance manuals, schedule maintenance, maintenance procedures, uh, special particular requirements, safety, um, and maybe then the overhaul and refurbishment. So there's a whole series. And then the service parts catalogue is a fundamental part. You can imagine how complicated a parts catalogue is for a train. And then now, in fact, they're working on at the moment the cleaning process and some of the other more long-term uh, overhaul processes they're going to have to add. Now, let's just look at how that's split. So from an architectural point of view, information architectural point of view, they had to push quite hard because in the past they've been a book. It's been a book paradigm. They've used documents that are, well, this is the document for doing this particular process and therefore it has a beginning and a middle and end type thing. And in order to make the most of this engineering data and specifically DITA, they wanted to have better reuse and therefore they felt that it was important to rethink the architecture of the content. So they broke it into three pieces, and this is the first one, which is a pre-task. Now, if any S1000D or uh, aerospace defence type chaps out there, that you might have heard of that. They've been doing this for a while. Um, but it is very specific to that industry and tends to be quite challenging. But they've applied it to this scenario. So the 700 specific is specific to one customer, and the 707 is a different customer. So in this case this pre-data tends to be not reused so well. It's specific to a part number, maybe has details about a particular safety procedure or an environment they're doing the work on, and that tends to be customer specific. So they accept that this tends to be a standalone fragment. Makes sense. But they've tried to put everything that that will apply to in one little bucket. And so it's a DITA topic if you're interested in the DITA aspect. And then we get to the steps, and the steps are the procedure. Yeah, How do I do this? I do this first, then that, then this. Warning about something else. Now these, now I've separated the pre-task, are very common. In fact, so common that they can literally drop them straight into another customer environment, and they don't have to do any changes. So there's a lot of commonality between the two. Also, there are commonalities within each one of those that can be then put into other places where you may have certain <coughs> procedures that need to be used in multiple times in specific scenarios. And then they have a final close-up, and the close-up is then how you perhaps clean up the job and make sure everything is uh, in the right place. Again, some commonality, quite a lot of commonality, and therefore there's a, lot, a great opportunity for reuse. So let's have a quick look at uh, a pre-task. Now, a pre-task, this is quite metadata-driven. And the, one of the things that John likes about this is that actually the engineer, or sorry, the authors, can actually dri drive it through attributes. So they're not having to do a lot of writing and hand cranking of the information. They can preset attributes within the authoring environment and that will pre-populate and then of course they're extracting information from their data sources being the PLM and the team center and so therefore a lot of this information is actually automatically extracted, controlled and managed by a person but ultimately not having to be hard, hard written. That makes sense. Interestingly there are some changes that are going to be happening and uh, I can illustrate uh, briefly. You see uh, the table that's got the green boxes in it. Now you wouldn't, 
I, I guess you wouldn't know. I certainly didn't. Maybe that's uh, a reflection on me. But um, you would not perhaps realise that this are actually the carriages that this particular process applies to. So the top two lines are two types of train. The top train is a, a six-car train. And the bottom... Is it six? Six? Eight? An eight-car train. Um, and the bottom one is a 12-car train. So it's actually illustrating where the carriage is that actually takes this. And in fact, these codes, uh, DMOC, the TOSLW, um, they all actually mean something like, uh, and I'm just trying to see one, that uh, if you have a bicycle, where's the B? MOSB? Uh, that's, the B means bicycle. So that's a carriage that can take a bicycle. So the code, when you see the train come into the it's the station you can have a look at the code at the end of the vehicle and you can actually tell whether it's got a toilet or whether it's got uh, well watch classes and things like that OC is open class so these pieces of data come from the original but they end up in the end user why I'm mentioning this though is that we're working on the updates to this using SVG which is a sc scalable vector graphics so that that actually can look like a train but also be dynamically created so that when they build this, they will actually show the picture of the train to make it a little bit more user-friendly and, and then be able to colour the trains automatically using the SVG and the XML code. Because we know where the components are and therefore we can drive it. In fact, there's other information here. On the left, it says equipment location. And this equipment location is used by the technicians to actually go and find in things. And I'll show you an example of that. And again, we can use that to drive the navigation. This is the actual task. And the task, I've only shown a very small part of it, um, but really to illustrate that it's got various things like warnings and cautions. And then you can just see, I know you can't probably read it terribly well, but the lines that have the little red box on it, the red box is actually a 3D image or, or a 3D video. And that's been pulled in using the authoring environment and, and, and is part of a step. Okay, and that's part of what's automatically generated when they burst these uh, 3D models. And I'll show you a little video in a second of how that kind of interacts. The other aspect of this I mentioned about the train operating manual. And the train operating manual is on an iPad. It can't rely on Wi-Fi. I don't know if you've ever used Wi-Fi on a train, but it's pretty bad. And uh, you can imagine just going through the tunnel. I'll just check what I need to do, and, it, and you lose the connection. Actually, I jest, of course, because they're strictly not allowed to use the iPad while they're driving. Um, but if you do want a free iPad, there are jobs going in uh, the southern part of the UK, and you get an iPad when you get the job, uh, and that's part of it. So every driver gets his own personal iPad. And, and this is really just a quick example to show some of the information and I've got I've got it on here on my iPad so if you wanted to have a closer look and see what the information looks like you know gladly come over um, and actually at that point I'm just going to make a point that John did say if you are interested in talking to him clearly he's not around today if you were interested in making contact um, I will gladly get you to put your name on here and in fact I'll pass it round if you want to give me your details, uh, just an email address, then I'll make sure that John and I are in touch and then we can give you some more information about this. The slides you're going to get will be the PDF version of the PowerPoints. If you talk to me and you put your name on there, once I've got approval, all of the notes that I've got on here I will share with you um, and that will give you a lot more detail and a lot more than that I've said because I've forgotten half of the things I'm supposed to say. Of course. Okay, so there's the train. I, I, I unfortunately at the last minute couldn't get a video installed here. I wanted to quickly show you a video of one of the things they actually see. But again, it's, uh, it's got a lot of videos, a lot of interactivity. And the information that they put in here, they can also add comments. And now those comments can be then redocked when they go back into the, uh, the office, so to speak, and then give them feedback to the, the, to the engineers or to the authors, I should say. Uh, and so they're hence it has to be fully offline or capable of supporting offline. The other manuals that they covered, and I'm really only touching on this with one quick slide, um, cover 
other things that are coming up like the cleaning that I mentioned earlier, the spare parts, they're looking at more interactive 3D models at the moment, um, and the fault diagnostics. And I, I am going to show you a quick slide about fault diagnostics. So while we have a maintenance manual, and that's fairly standard, I imagine, you'd, you'd agree, uh, and, and it shows procedures, there are other issues that you might need to have, like a fault diagnostic. So I suppose you could call it a frequently asked questions. And the fault diagnostic on cars, we know they have computers you plug in and you can actually download all sorts of information these days. Um, with the train, of course, you have similar things. There are various faults that you might come across, and we want to be able to capture those. The challenge is, when you've got a new train, and I mean new, completely new stock, new design, we don't know what the faults are going to be. In fact, there probably won't be many faults, will there? I mean, it is well built. And I jest, but um, they actually haven't used this bit very much yet because they haven't come across many faults, I'm pleased to say, uh, without sounding uh, churlish. That is really good German engineering. And he's saying that we are going to get some over the next few years, but at the moment we're just not seeing them. The mechanical faults are just not there. However, they have published some of their standard faults that they're expecting. And the system that they've adopted using the DidaWeb technology to create this whole life cycle has allowed them to create effectively a knowledge base, a bit like a wiki. Uh, it's not really a wiki, but it is effectively in a, in a similar way, and it's building a knowledge base. So they wanted the technicians on the shop floor to be able to add information and say, I've come across a new fault. I mean, what normally happens in that scenario? It gets written on a fag packet or on the back of a post-it note and then maybe get lost in the system somewhere. And so they really wanted it. This relates to the TQs that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so this is some real data. Uh, you'll see the second one down. It's talking about if the fault um, uh, is reported about the unit's mileage, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, the mileage won't get recorded and therefore needs to be manually entered. Now, this is perhaps not very important to most of us, but from an engineering point of view and keeping track of this, it's absolutely ideal. And so someone's identified that and added it to the fault information. Now, the one below, though, is actually a bit more verbose. It's not particularly well written, but it's a real one, and you'll see that it's pending. And the idea is that it can be accessed today, so the engineers or technicians that need to know today can see it, but once they've had time to ratify it and check its quality and maybe rewrite it, it will then get uh, published in a, a complete way and maybe get refined. So there's a whole loop going through where this knowledge base is going to be growing. It actually goes further because the documentation itself, they're expecting the odd comment. And again, these are real comments on the real documents. So although the objective is to get perfect documents the first time, by using better engineering data in the first place, really the truth be known, we're not perfect and we'll end up with a few errors. And John's comment was, can you imagine my desk if I didn't have this system? He said, we've had five to 700 documents now deployed and everyone has had some form of comment on it. I would have five or 600 comments on my desk. It would be a mess. Uh, that was in a recent meeting when we were discussing the, the, this presentation. Um, so this type of interaction has been really useful and then gets straight to the author. It doesn't go into some PDF file that then gets buried in an email or is just added somewhere where you never get to see it. It's actually directly associated with the original source document so that we actually can connect the authoring data topic with the comments that have been written. And so this has given them a real connectivity. So this is just a little example of um, the interface. And in fact, I'll, I'll go to a video and it will probably show, show that better. So this is what the technician sees. It's a, a web, web portal. Um, you can see the purple numbers down the left-hand side, which shows the number of topics that relate to something. How are we doing on time? I've got three minutes, have I? Four. <sighs> Better get my skates on. Uh, how do I do this? Oh, here we go. 
Oh, it is running. How about that? So you're just really running through, and I wanted really to, to give you a bit of a flavour, you know, I'm, uh, just to see. Here's that pre-topic uh, with some of the information. Now we're running without realising it straight into the main topic where the procedures are. So we can join these up in actually a did a map, and then you hit the go button and then start seeing what the procedure is. We can then run a video while it's doing, and critically, as the video is running, the steps progress. So the engineer can see which step they're looking at because it's actually connected to the video. So there is a joined up piece of information. And it's speeded up. The rate here is about two or three times. So don't think they have to work quite that quick. Uh, but I didn't think what you'd want to sit through uh, a long video. So some very, very interesting 3D animation capability. But then also the steps that they can work through and stop pause, go back to, and then if they see an error and they're not happy, they can make a comment, feed it back. Um, and if, of course, they're familiar with this process, they've done it lots of times, they don't need to watch the video, they can just run through the steps and remind themselves what the critical bits are. So it really works for both levels. So last three slides, which I think I might just get away with. 50%. Now, I would say that's a load of nonsense. Wouldn't you agree? How possibly could they say 50%? But I tell you, John, and of course he can't be here to back it up, but he is absolutely adamant about this. And fundamentally, actually, the reason for this is the discovery. He said, I have spent so little time having to go out and figure out how these pieces of equipment join together because of the 3D capability and being able to extract and look and modify and open up pieces, all from the original engineering data, but also because of the reuse. So that supported that. So they've been with the combination of reuse and the access and the whole connectivity within one database of all of their data, engineering data, he's been able to save a huge amount. And in fact, his objective was to be able to produce the all the documentation for the trains before they went live. In fact, six months before it was in production, in actually in service, they wanted to have the documents available. Six months. And he got promoted. So guess what? He actually did hit his target. So that six month early was a massive part of this benefit. The, uh, the other comment that was made, which ben, by Ben Wardle, was they were thinking, and it's difficult at this early stage because they've deployed about 30 trains at this stage. So it's still early days out of 115. But they're seeing what they believe is an estimate of about 30% reduction in the time spent on maintenance. Now, this is partly because the original content was a better quality. It's partly because they've been able to use more 3D, which we're not all able to do, I understand, uh, which means that they've got less text, so it's a bit easier. But it's also because they're able to get this feedback loop and be able to modify content very quickly and get it back out there without it becoming an issue so they don't get this non-conformance, because that costs a fortune. They've got two, uh, two shifts working on a train on a 20,000-mile service. They can't afford one of those shifts to get suddenly stopped, and then it drags on. You can imagine how quick these trains need to be in and out on the process. So as a final sort of sum-up slide, um, these are some of the perhaps the, the key things. Improved collaboration and teamwork, and that's reduced their time to market for sure. Uh, the maintenance and the technical publications data is completely in sync with their engineering data because effectively they're using the same system. Now, uh, just to support the other tools out there, that doesn't mean you have to buy Team Center, and I never was wanting to pitch that, but it does mean that you should have at least people like CanIT, maybe Mekon or, or Team Center team themselves who understand the PLM data so that you can make some use of it because uh, that is not being done. I can tell you it's not being done in so many companies I, I see. Um, and then this helps with their, um, their first time results, getting the quality, that's for sure, and reducing the text. And then using some form of delivery platform like DidaWeb will ensure that the content is getting to them in the right place, right time. You know the, you know, the, the standard phrase these days. Um, but also in a format that suits their needs, whether it's on an iPad, a rugged tablet, whether it's just in the, in the office. Uh, they're actually, I'm quite um, 
well, I'm excited if I dare be, because when I go into the office and see them, they're saying, do you know what, we really enjoy using this documentation. How many people do you know say, I really enjoy using your documentation? So the fact that they're saying this is really, really good. And that is the end of my presentation with about five seconds to spare. And this is the little button that you need to use to be able to get information. Um, there are loads of things I'm sure I dwell, glossed over and I didn't get a chance to, to cover. So my apologies for that in advance. If you do find the name and you want to put a name down, I will get you more information than you'll get off the site. If we are allowed the odd question, yeah, um, I'll give you uh, any questions. You can have either a luggage label or you can have a mouse mat. Or you don't have to have any of them. It's not compulsory. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what is your expectation on uh, necessary maintenance concerning the lifetime of the so-called documentation technology? Mm -hmm. Your trains will be in service for 30 years. Correct. How long will be your, I don't know, video formats? Uh, absolutely, isn't that a great question? So, yeah, if you didn't hear it, okay, we've got a train that's running for, for 30 years. What's going to happen to the odd, weird format that we're using today in 30 years? Because everything's going to change. And, and in all honesty, we don't know, do we? But I think that's really a big plug for Ditter. The reason that I'm passionate about Ditter is because it is a standard. It may not be the best one in the world, but it is certainly the best of that type in this position at the moment. And it is certainly the only open standard that does it for us. Um, SVG was going to die, wasn't it? It's funny, because it hasn't. And it's still being used. There will be changes to video formats for sure. I think the, the simple answer to that is I think those things will be unplugged and replugged. And the point is that the engineering data that created those videos they still have in their team center system. So if in 10 years time there is a change, the company themselves don't want to lose their data because that will be evolving. Yes, we all know there is pain, but it's perhaps less pain if you move from XML to XML. And they'll be able to re reproduce that information and then still connect it up with the XML. Because I really believe XML will still be around, even if uh, the latest video format is slightly more compressed and does something else and whizzy. Yeah, mouse mat or <laughs> uh, any others? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to say that. Well, one of the. So why do they do it, or why? How do they motivate them? Is what you're saying. Yeah. You can have both for that one. Uh, <laughs> um, now, listen, this is a really good point because one of the things I forgot to mention was that um, Siemens have a bonus system. And lots of companies have bonus systems. But what I really love about Siemens is the management have got it. They've sussed it. Because what they've said is if you make a suggestion, we've all heard suggestion boxes, if you make a suggestion that is accepted we will put a penny in your pot. It's actually a euro, a pound, I think. It's a point. And each point means a, a, a pound or a dollar. Okay? So every suggestion you make goes in there. Well, in the past, it's not very easy to do that. And actually now, we're just working on some enhancements to this so they can actually have a leaderboard so you can see which team... Yeah, so they have various shop floor teams. They can see which team has made the most comments. So they're actually really motivated to do it. They love the fact they can go in and put comments. And in fact, John said only last week, he said, they're actually coming to my desk and talking to me about it and saying, oh, yeah, I've added some comments. Yeah, it's okay, I'll see them. I've got them. Said, yeah, but I've added some comments, you know. <laughs> so um, I think they are getting a lot of motivation from that. And that, that's, that's, that's A, because it's easy to do. B, because we're now realising we can add some extra feedback so they can see that it's doing something for them and see the management get it and they've connected it with something that motivates them. Uh, maybe not just the pound notes, but also uh, that there is a bit of a team camaraderie. And he said, I can tell you which, which are the shifts that do the most, who are the best and, and who are the most motivated. Does that answer the question? I'm suspecting I'm not allowed to ask any more. 
So I'm going to have to say thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, I'm glad I didn't lose too many people, and I only saw a few people dozing off. Um, so thank you. Um, come down to the stand if you want to talk to me or any of my colleagues a bit more about what we do. Um, this was just one example of some of the interesting things we're on. And uh, have a good conference for the rest of your days. Thank you.